Hello and welcome to Beyond Top 10 Tennis. My name is Dr. Ashley Morgan Burge and I'm your host. I'm the author of 11 books, a CEO of 12 years, the founder of a startup set on data privacy. Most importantly, I am an elite performance coach of over 18 years, having worked with athletes throughout Europe, the United States to Australia. And most excitingly, I am the world's leading scientist on coach and athlete performance, specifically behind how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. That's right. My work includes everything from mitigating injuries to conditioning behaviors that set a player up long term for the long game towards a top 10 tennis ranking. I am behind theories from the optimal performance theory, optimal behavior for optimal performance, the barrier breaker, the rule of transference to the golden rule. As has become custom, each episode we dive into one of my books to share additional insights and dig a little bit deeper. Um, We've been focusing on the secrets to optimal performance success with over 30 episodes to date. So today's topic plays its own role, like so many other episodes in developing the player, parent to coach for that road ahead towards a top 10 tennis ranking. So as always, buckle in and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would love to hear your feedback on that intro. Um, I wanted to really fine tune that because we are over 30 episodes deep now. We're up to, would you believe it or not, episode 36, which is incredible. We have come such a long way. So for all of you um, out there who have sent through your feedback, thank you so much. If this is your first time you're tuning in, look, thank you so much. Uh, If you, I guess, rewind, back to where we first begun you'll see how far we've come so I really hope you you stay with us and and enjoy the ride like I always try to share but to see how much we've been growing and believe it or not this is the first text the the secrets to optimal performance success a comprehensive discussion on developing elite coaches and players and there are another 10 (laughs) so I think that's so incredibly exciting from that uh standpoint uh look To dive into it today, we're on page 189 if you'd like to follow along. And the topic we're really diving into today is when should players take time off if they become sick? The balancing act. And as has become custom in all episodes is that we really like taking that humanized approach. And really, we look at it going just because it is tennis and or the tennis player, there's so much more, which I guess shines that spotlight on beyond, beyond top 10 tennis, because uh, we know when we're developing those optimal performances, the parameters, the outcomes, it is assimilated with obviously that in life. So the seven keys to optimize your life (laughs) is just that because even though it uses tennis and frames tennis in that and obviously that they are the seven keys towards that top 10 tennis ranking there's so much more so it's applicable for the parents to the coaches to to the the board directors everyone to, to the teachers anyone that's out there um, it's applicable too. So you could be a lawyer, you could be an accountant, um, you could work at your local primary school. It does not matter. And I think that's what's so powerful, having looked at, and obviously the data is there, and when we're looking at obviously developing, you know, that, that top developing those skills that not only put you in that one percent 
we can look at the 1% in life as well. And I think that's where it's so powerful um, at that cross section. And this is probably the first time I think where I'm really, I think, shedding a bit more light on that. But obviously, there's so much more to that. And that's just a quick summary in respect, obviously, that humanized approach. But today's topic, I think, is no different because we find ourselves in this I think struggle for balance more often than not in today's world so whether you are that play athlete that coach that parent specifically in I think you know this this tennis landscape that we touch on when we're looking towards developing you know the top 10 tennis ranking but we're specifically looking at the pathway in the long game you look at that balancing act between time and when to take time off and obviously you do get sick sickness unfortunately it does happen from you know minor bouts of a cold and flu to more serious bouts and it's a part of life and th- these little uh, i think factors are incredibly important to be mindful of because unfortunately i think we live in a world that encourages you to push through or has for such a long time and it really does transpire onto the court and or the playing field if you are in another sport if you are thank you for tuning in because there are so many cross sections in this respect and what happens is that you overload yourself you overdo yourself and so that sickness then can get worse and it can come back and when we're looking at obviously that sporting spectrum we're looking at overtraining so if you train too much it is a pitfall that you can fall into and i think most episodes i really do try to share i think that personalized approach so uh (laughs) this is one i think on one side i the wrong mentality so I'll preface this by the wrong mentality and this is where this work has come from because there's been so much learning personally from this as well and not so much I won't say in the tennis context but those of you who have been listening for some time now are familiar with my bouts with ultra running so ultra training and I'll be really quick here by saying uh, once upon a time, uh, roughly approximately 10 years ago, I did a little bit too much. And when I say that, I was clocking 150 kilometre weeks, uh, back to back weeks, and eventually I did 180 kilometres in a week. Um, and this is no secret, you can go on AMA International and it's all there. But uh, one of the pitfalls was th- to that, um, lo and behold, was the overtraining. And so there was a lot of suffering after that. There was time off after that. There were injuries after that. And even though, and I think the lesson here is that you you think you're putting in the right type of work, the right type of recovery. If you are not resting enough, these things will happen. Personally, I wasn't. I was not resting enough. From, I think, that practical and performance standpoint, everything was in place Um, otherwise I would not have been able to to run that amount and all that that distance within that time period and so all of I think you know the work uh, behind I think the data of what I do I worked on transferring that so to speak to I think this new performance so with new type of metrics but I stubbornly forgot to factor in the amount of rest that I needed and so unfortunately that end result was more time off than planned and recovering that was a little bit longer than intended but obviously I think the moral of the story there is that you could even for the coaches and parents think that your you know your child your player your athlete is doing everything right and you have this specific periodization you have that chart work set out but have you factored in enough rest now more often than not the mistake is made that for the younger players they don't need to rest as much and look there is some truth to that within reason because they will recover quicker and bounce back quicker but this is a huge but well one 
that is an exception to the rule. The rule is obviously rest is best, but you need to condition the athlete to know what that recovery is. Obviously, to sustain a performance um, with youth on your side, more often than not, you can keep going and going and going. But if that player athlete, that develop <laughs> that developmental player is not conditioned to know specifically what when to stop, what that metric is, what that sign is, what that warning sign is to stop, they won't stop. They will keep going and eventually they'll get hurt. And that's where it's so pivotal for that parenting coach to step in. I cannot tell you how often, and I know I've touched on this in previous episodes, I've come across players and athletes, irrespective of where I've been based in the world, they don't stop. They continue to train relentlessly and the coaches um, almost applaud that. And obviously, I really hope we've made progress here that you do need rest. And it really is important. It is fundamental to teach the key proponents of recovery so that play athlete, well, one, they know what that feels like. They know what it feels like to be fresh because they're conditioned to recover. But it two, it's integrating that into the training load so into the, the that chart work so the, that periodization includes when you're planning on reaching that next peak performance but also the necessary rest now i would encourage everyone's going to be different but there should definitely be weeks not just a few days weeks throughout a given season so throughout a year and a player athlete should have set long periods off to aid their optimal performance outcomes. Okay, so if you'd like to follow along today, again, we're on page 189, so let's dive in. We all have trained when we've been sick. We all have, I am sure, made ourselves even more ill by doing this. All but there are many of you out there, like me, who have trained to the extent where they have overtrained and as a consequence were literally forced to have ample time off to recover. By ample, I mean weeks. Now, this is obviously something I touched on from my personal account, but going back or rewinding back to when I was touching on about, you know, irrespective of where I've been based, the players and athletes I've seen have not taken time off, that this has not been included, um, specifically when you're at that high performing level. Obviously, if you're in the junior ranks and obviously your, your training is aligned with your school days or your school seasons, typically it is quite common practice for you know the players athletes um, within that age group to take you know the weeks between terms and or semesters off from practice however once you begin to advance tournaments end up filling up those spaces so it's, it's really not resting now rest obviously comes in varying shapes and forms but essentially when we're talking about it it's about being not necessarily fully away from the courts, but it's that, that really lighter load. So you could be playing for fun without the load, which means with your friends, but without the load, without the pace, without the power. So that is very different. In this age bracket though, that is very challenging for a lot of, I'll say, teenagers to do. Now, I obviously acknowledge and understand the why behind this, and that's why it's encouraged to do other. So you could do other sports if that's what you want to do. That is where you get your enjoyment from, where you're 
happy to have that active rest. However, there are many other forms of rest, whether that is you enjoy gaming and you're catching up on that. It's an opportunity, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but also screen time. If you're not someone that obviously actively uses screen time, these are periods throughout the year, typically four to six periods factored in. They, and now these can expand and um, shrink depending obviously on I think you know your set performances and what you have in place. So th- this is just I'll say a guesstimate because it, it really is individual, but planning, planning is key to factor this in but it's more so encouraging you to do different so again as i touched on earlier if you're listening but you're from another sport (laughs) wonderful this is an opportunity where you might play tennis but for those who are obviously playing tennis it's an opportunity to go play another sport for enjoyment obviously with an emphasis set on reducing the load Um, and that is absolutely fundamental because we're looking at time where your body gets to recuperate Um, so more often than not it is away from sport it's away from activity it's slowing that down so your body is just it takes a breather (laughs) and that is always healthy and encouraged not necessarily for a full week um, but factoring that type in there's obviously activity to an extent is encouraged but it's so important to get it right and it really depends on your individual needs what you enjoy doing it's completely up to you but for the parents and coaches listening out there, I really hope I, I, you know, alarm bells are going off going, okay, I need to factor this in and make sure that's there. Now, especially when you reach that peak performance, and again, there's going to be typically, you know, it could be anywhere from four to eight peaks in a given season. Uh, and again, it is going to vary because it really depends on your, those goals in place and what you're working towards, but you need the recovery there. So typically after each peak, you're going to drop right back down to a really low level. Um, so a low load um, expected of you before you're looking at building that back up. Now, when you're doing that low low, these are optimal times for rest, having rest periods, active recovery periods, and also time off as well. And I can't stress that enough. And because again, we've touched on in previous episodes about the athlete identity. Now, this is a very important topic. I won't go into it. I do encourage you to take a listen, though, if you are interested, I think, in more detail. But essentially, what happens, and specifically for the coaches and players um, or parents out there, if your whole identity is consumed by tennis, made up of tennis and everything inside it, then your identity is attached to the sport in and of itself. And on one on one side, that can be wonderful because your heart's in it, etc. I'm I got you. Uh, I hear you. I've been there. But what we're saying is that we want another identity, whatever that is, what whatever you enjoy doing. Um, whatever your second favorite thing is, it, it doesn't matter if tennis obviously is your number one. But we want to make sure there's a distinction there between your tennis life and the other because the other is incredibly important. The other serves the purpose for your off time, that recovery time, that rest time. And tennis is, uh, I get get it. It's what you love doing. You enjoy doing it. You're in it for the long game. (laughs) I'm hearing you. You have those aspirations to head towards the top 10. Now you could be top 900 in the world, top 200 in the world. You could be top 20 in the world. Irrespective, I get you. The, The point here is in the other. 
and making sure that you're allowing that space to accommodate the other and so that's where you're making the time for that and that tennis is not consuming everything and it's so important to be mindful of that identity because as you evolve throughout your 20s the later 20s to later 30s this is a part that becomes even more powerful so when after that 10 to 20 years of play that we've previously touched on and you decide that you're going to stop playing now this happens more often than not for a lot in their late teens 20s where they opt not to turn professional so and this is where it's it's absolutely fundamental for coaches and parents to be aware of this obviously for the players who are on tour at the moment wta and or atp tours and you are inside the top 100 and you're maintaining that level hopefully you're there and you're maintaining that for the next you know five ten years obviously for the for the earlier career athletes you still need that other that other is the more important but it takes a different role and a different shape so that is more streamlined what's less streamlined is what happens when it's almost like a, a cliff is is happening or it's presenting itself for the later teens they've reached their peaks and they want to uh, progress on tour and they continue to progress on tour until something happens that prevents them now if this is you and it happens it's okay it's very common <laughs> it's very very common uh, coaches and parents really need to be mindful of this Typically, it's going to happen between that 17 to 22, 23 years of age. Now, more often than not, it happens because results have not um, happened like planned. A player has not secured their first ranking points. And it's often a time where funding runs dry, where those sponsorships may not be happening, etc unfortunately yes these things do happen it can happen and so that identity that other is even more fundamental to help uh, transition it's not something I really um, like talking about but it's really important and I say I don't like as such because I innately believe with all the work all the data that you can overcome that hurdle if the work is there and that's obviously something that I faced uh, head on and I went through all of that so for those of you who are thinking of that or you're going through it feel free please to jump onto one of our social channels and reach out because I'm more than happy to have a chat uh, with you uh, about that and that is obviously underpins the power of the seven keys because and I was share, I wrote something about this just last week and it's really about sharing that these things unfortunately happen and it did happen to me but the work is there now and why I've spent the last 18 years of my career um, putting the work in to prevent that you have to go through it to make sure if this happens to you there are steps in place to ensure it's not as bumpy but also options in place for your performance that are more accessible and affordable to keep you on the pathway if that's what you wish okay let's dive back in by ample i mean weeks the price paid for not knowing when to rest thankfully as i have become older and wiser over the years i have a little bit more common sense (laughs) but this doesn't always mean we practice what we preach does it this is for the coaches and parents out there uh common sense uh, i know it's there i know you have it but it's so important to remember and i'm sorry to the athletes and players out there if the parents to the coaches or the adults in the room common sense is not universal 
and uh, hopefully you know that maybe you don't but it's not and sometimes you need to take a little bit more effort to explain to share the power of rest and to be really mindful of that to really uh, condition that child your player your athlete into why the rest is pertinent for their performance I know I I have fallen guilty to this at times, but I'd like to start off by saying as long as we catch ourselves in the act and apply methods of reflective practice to rectify this, we ourselves as coaches are always developing and improving, finding the right balance. Now, reflective practice is incredible. Incredibly powerful. It should be, and I hope it is, if there's anything you take away from today's episode, aside from rest is important and it needs to be integrated in your chart work, it is reflective practice. Now, those of you who are going, oh, what do you, I, I want reflective practice, it, it means exactly what it says. It's it's, re- it's reflecting on your performance. Now, this is t- touching on both players and obviously coaches. But specifically in this respect, I'm, I'm really talking about the coaches. And for each of the coaches out there, and obviously parents, if you, you're a part of that triangular relationship that we've touched on in earlier episodes, it's for you too. But it's really taking the time to reflect on what's working and what's not working. What's working well for you, the coach, and what's not. And then what has been working well for your player and what's not. Now, if you are a coach with multiple players, it's so important to go for that one player, one player at a time, not all of them. Don't bunch them all together. We know and we've touched on that that's a detriment. It's really about individualizing that approach for each individual player and making those uh, respective modifications. So reflective practice is, is really a practice. Just like mindfulness, for example, or meditation that you may or may do or not do on a daily or weekly basis, or your stretching that you may or may not do on a daily or weekly basis. It's about integrating that level of awareness that you of the importance of reflective practice and making it a habit because it's a form of review where you're reviewing what's been working and what has not been, but it's internal. So you get to ask yourself those questions that obviously aid in performance. And this comes full circle when we're looking at, you know, taking time off and you're being sick and how we can balance that. If you're not conscious of it through reflective practice, then the likelihood of you encouraging your player athlete to take time off and or for the parent or child is going to be quite small. The big question most people ask coaches, players, and even parents, when should I or my child player take time off? (laughs) Firstly, and let me be as frank as possible. If your child or player is sick, this is a clear warning sign and indicator that they need to take time off. (laughs) But there is a balancing act. This balance is what is going to be delved into. Okay, before we do that, this is so important. If your child is feeling unwell, they can take the day off. They can just rest. If, however, they are just feeling a bit under the weather and they're not full-blown sick, obviously if you're full-blown sick, do not stay in bed. (laughs) Rest, Um, obviously, in this context. When we are, however, looking at not feeling 100%, if they are known to be okay, So for the players and athletes that are okay on court, coaches need to know this and lower, lessen the load, which means if they want to be on court and they're able to and their parent believes they are relatively healthy, they're just not feeling 100%, maybe they're at like 90%, lessen the load, which means you want that athlete working below that 80% mark. 
ideally that 50 60 percent if they want to just get rhythm hit some balls make sure their contact points on make sure they're serving you know we're practicing their ball toss no first serve second serve see a slow low capacity things that, um, of that nature we're going to say that's okay in this context for them to be active on court however working above that threshold is going to be detrimental because you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring so you want to maintain a low level if that's an option and that is why it's so integral for that triangular relationship for the parents and the coaches and obviously that play that athlete because having all three in the discussion and having obviously that dialogue allows especially the coach and parent there to be conscious of that child, the athlete's health, and if that is appropriate. If it is not, then that's, that's a no. If it is, and it only is appropriate if the parent acknowledges that they are relatively healthy otherwise, they're just not feeling 100%, but they really wanted to come to practice today and they're good, we're going to lower that threshold. We're going to be incredibly mindful because we're making modifications. We do take that individualized approach to account for this. So this is, I guess, that fine line. You get to use the balancing act when it's to take time off and or accommodating just a slight lull. Being sick is one thing, but sickness from overtraining is another. Most developmental athletes will get sick a handful of times throughout the year purely because they're exposed to other children, adolescents that, well, just get sick in different seasons. It is a part of growing up. Sure, the healthier these players are, the less susceptible they are to getting sick. But when you have a player or a child who is constantly blowing their nose, coughing up colourful things and has a temperature fever that feels like they've been training in the midday sun first thing in the morning, you know they should rest and take some time off. Okay, that was a big section. <laughs> and it cannot be any more clear. That is obviously, they're unwell, they are sick, that is time off. It is, it, that, that's a red flag. Not a green flag, that's a red flag. But it's so important to acknowledge where. So where they obviously caught that from. If everyone else is healthy and it's otherwise, and all of a sudden they have become unwell, that their body has hit its max, they're feeling weak and exhausted. No more training, time off from training. It is the coach's and parent's responsibility to prevent this. Obviously for the athletes, the players later on. So we're looking at 17, 18 plus here, who obviously are more equipped with the skills to know. And I only say equipped with the skills to know if they've been conditioned. Because you can get a lot of players, athletes in their 20s or throughout their 20s that don't know uh, correct rest periods uh, because they've never followed that chart work before or haven't had it um, accurately done for them before for them to learn off and for them to in turn become conditioned towards. So it, it really starts at the beginning throughout those developmental years when we're teaching good and healthy habits about what rest means, what recovery means, and to be able to take adequate time off, and that it is a balance. Because if you wanna reach a peak performance, rest and recovery is a part of that. So we've touched on those different, I think, peaks that you will have a few times um, a year make sure rest is included in that as well. So every child, every athlete, every player should know what that means. They should actively be learning throughout those years, throughout, you know, 10, 11, 12, upwards to 18, 19 years of age. And obviously by the time from that 17 plus, they're on the same page. They know that child work. They're helping you do it. 
and they're reviewing it with you so they know they're equipped with the tools to progress further so if they're in there if they're on the cusp of the end of their first 10 years of play and they're about to enter their second 10 years of play they know they have the tools they have been conditioned to follow what rest means to them because it also safeguards the athlete if and because i guess we'll finish on this because if that is not incorporated in a players or athletes i think um learning framework so their performance framework because obviously they're they're learning different metrics along the way overtraining they're obviously susceptible to that uh quite frequently but rest is incredibly powerful which means one peak performance may not align with the next peak performance it may be less because they haven't had adequate time to recover if there's a peak performance and rest is included in there with adequate recovery then the likelihood of them reaching their next peak performance and increasing so progressing from that initial peak is more likely now athletes also become more susceptible without rest and without recovery to developing an injury and i think if you've been obviously following along for some time now you know how passionate i am about uh mitigating injuries because it is possible we have the data there that says yes it actually is possible um but there are uh, obviously the metrics to put in place to begin with and obviously the conditioning as well so if you're a coach or parent out there it is possible if you're that play athlete and you're suffering from injuries no more it is possible you need to have those discussions um, with your coach and or find the right coach that will modify your training for you to accommodate your body so modification is key but that has been on previous episodes really trying to wrap this up and it's real it's, it's about obviously the balance comes so when you are sick and or not feeling well you obviously have the two options of taking a hundred percent time off if you obviously are you're you're unwell though the fine line that's there if you're feeling less than 100 percent, you're obviously at that you know 80 percent not not quite there but you know you're relatively feeling healthy and you want to be there and please that triangular approach recall you can participate on a lower load but work on activities that ignore that are not um extraneous in that respect low loads if that's not possible take that day take the rest okay and rest can also um and or practice can also on both sides is incredibly powerful to be sidelined but to look at your competitors and or your teammates and what they're doing. That's an incredible learning experience. And I have done that and continue to do that with so many players and athletes that I work with because if for the coaches out there, you can condition your athletes on what to look for and they're able to look for it in themselves over time and to engage in more active discussions with you. And you can start that from a young age. It's obviously up to obviously that individual. So for the players and athletes that are out there, it's up to you. But it's what you're looking at and or for. And being able to ascertain the outcome of that. If it's good, maybe not. Is it applicable for you? Maybe not. But what does it mean for that player using that type of skill? Some are into it, others are not. But it's an option. And I believe options are important. More so, one of the fundamentals there is reviewing, obviously, the point structure and becoming familiar with that. So if for the players, athletes out there, you end up playing one of those uh, individuals you're reviewing, you will actually be, be quite familiar with their setup. And that's always a bit, a bit of fun, a bit of a mind game there in, in a healthy way. Um, if you are forced to rest, but you are able to participate. So you're not 
bed bound, so to speak. Okay, uh, again, rest is so important. It's so fundamental. And when, lo- when we're looking at, obviously, that pathway in the long game towards that top 10 tennis ranking, the balancing act is incredibly important. Taking rest is incredibly important. And factoring that, obviously, in that chart work, and making sure you're planning for those peak performances so we're trying to prevent you getting sick but also if you are unwell don't be shy to have that discussion with your coach about you know taking that time off whether it's three four days it could be one two weeks it could be more it's okay it's a part of life it is again remember that humanized approach and it's again making those modifications and being specific about what that end goal is and just making those changes as needed so you stay on track to head towards that long game and obviously that's towards that top 10 tennis ranking. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I know we got, I think, um, we carried away a little bit at the end, but we really dived in, I think, to the idea of rest and being unwell, I think, for, for most most parts. Um, and then our little segues there. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed, I think, the differences there. And I think that's what it's these episodes are always about. It's about drawing out those additional insights um, that can be shared, which are incredibly powerful, I think, from that perspective. And look, if you want to grab a copy of The Secrets to Optimal Performance, success head on over to AMA International that's amainternational.com um, for any comments or questions head on over to AMA or Topic Thread that's the only social network that I am on uh, to interact with Beyond Top 10 Tennis head on over to Twitter Threads LinkedIn or Instagram uh, to catch up on our weekly coaching tips head on over to TikTok and to catch up obviously on our blog Logs, you can head on over to Medium or as always uh, look on AMA International head on over to our news and our blogs page but look I will leave all the links in the episode notes because I know that that's a bit of a, a lot there jam-packed um, for something different head on over to Pink Octopus Books that's where my fictional release is that's uh, just for a bit of fun uh, to view this week's uh, questions and polls be sure to visit our uh, Spotify um, or for something left of field, visit Spruik for some random polls. And this is a bit new on there. So again, links are all in the episode notes and feedback is incredibly appreciated. And of course, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, like, and share, and all of the above would be absolutely phenomenal. And look, as always, please come and say hi on one of those social channels beyond top 10 tennis is there and I do try to take a peek at most of them and if you're lucky we might even have a good chat Um, so I'm always up for that and that's always a bit of fun for those of you who are interested we do have scholarships available on AMA International as well and options to work with me exclusively so hopefully that's a really good thing to optimize your performance I know it is you know it is so uh, that's a little bit of a nudge and obviously if you're really serious I think on a serious note to head towards that top 10 tennis ranking don't be shy and come and say hi um, because that's what this is all about that's what AMA International is all about and you may be ranked 900 in the world you may be ranked 500 in the world you may be ranked top 20 in the world if you are in that niche you are my favorites Uh, no I don't like picking favorites there but if, if you are looking obviously for that edge you know where to come Okay, on that note, thank you so much for listening. I am so incredibly grateful. I am your host, Dr. Ashley Morgan-Burge, and this is Beyond Top 10 Tennis, and I'll see you next time.